Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to get to the last part of our study on 1 Timothy 3.16. Okay? Received up into glory. At first, I thought this wasn't going to be that long of a study because you just read the story about Jesus going up in glory. But what's important about that? God put it on my heart to share some things with you. So get your King James Bibles out. And like I've always said, you... The, the beauty about video ministries is you can pause the video, turn to the scriptures, and then unpause the video. You can pause the video and say, Lord, and start talking to the Lord about the study and say, what about this verse over here? And I might end up co covering that verse eventually. <laughs> or I might not get to that verse and you find verses that I could have used that I didn't use. But the beauty about video ministries is you can pause the video and turn to the scriptures. But it's King James Bibles that you need. This is God's perfect written word in English. Don't mess with any of those Catholic Bibles. All the other Bible perversions, including the New King James, are Bible perversions. Stay away from them. So in your Bibles, your King James Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy if I can say it right, 1 Timothy 3.16. Yeah. And this is the main verse we went off of, and we broke it down to explain each individual point that was being made here. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We talked about that. The likeness of sinful flesh. It was very important that God gave up Jesus Christ, the body of the Godhead, gave up his incorruptible body to get a corruptible body that's the likeness of sinful flesh. That body knew no sin as far as he was concerned. But it was capable of taking on the sins of the world which is why he was able to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. Because he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. His incorruptible body couldn't. But we talked about that. Justified in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The reason John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove is Jesus was justified off, over and over and over again by the Holy Spirit. Remember, before two or three witnesses. Okay. God the Father is a witness, the Holy Spirit's a witness. Seen of angels. We talked about how there were angels. Jesus said one time when Peter got the sword back here, <laughs> Peter lobbed off the ear. I can ask God, he's talking about the Father, the soul. I can ask God, my Father, and he would send thousands of angels to protect me. Okay? Angels were involved in the light and God's earthly ministry, Jesus Christ. Okay? And preached unto the Gentiles. We just got finished talking about preached unto the Gentiles and believed on into the world. Salvation went out into the world. The Jews rejected as a nation, rejected Jesus Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about that again. How they rejected Jesus Christ as a nation. Therefore, salvation went out to the world. Went to the Gentiles. And it was believed on in the world. Jews weren't the only ones that believed. The Gentiles believed. Salvation used to be of the Jews. Now it's to the world. Anybody can get saved. Not everybody will get saved. And we're on the last part here, received up into glory. So what's this talking about? Well, first let's read, let's turn to Acts, if you can, turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to read the story of Jesus ascending up after his death, burial, and resurrection. He's seen over 40 days with the, with the brethren, preaching and teaching to them. And he's ascending up. Let's read that story. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former trees have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, received up into glory, to whom also he showed himself, after, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. Remember, in his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ, starting with John the Baptist, they were preaching repentance. Repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And kingdom of God can be a reference to the physical kingdom, but the kingdom of God that's being talked about is Jesus is having to teach him now about the spiritual kingdom. He started a little bit before his death, burial, res death, burial and resurrection to teach him about the spiritual kingdom of God. Okay? But he really had to bring it home because they were so looking forward to the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And he had to teach them about the spiritual kingdom because the physical kingdom got put off. 
Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And once again, I've always got to bring this up. Water baptism does nothing for you. Nothing. It's an outward ordinance. It's something you can do as an outward showing to the brethren. I'm here alone. There's no brethren to do it to be an outward showing. There's no point in me getting water baptized. What's important is spiritually being baptized. Baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's what saves people. Not water baptism. Okay? God, Jesus Christ, saves people through the Holy Spirit. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember what he said, he bet that Jesus is the one that baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Talking about hell on the lake of fire. Saved, get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Lost, get baptized with fire. But Jesus is the one that does the baptizing, not fit the physical act of water baptism. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When, there, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? See, they're still looking at that physical kingdom. And Jesus, if the physical kingdom was going to come in, there's no point in him being uh, caught up, received up into glory. He can just stay and be their king. He's like, will thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Verse 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in our own power. He's received up into glory because the millennial kingdom, what we call the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign, the Bible talks about for a thousand year period, Jesus is going to rule and reign as king. King of kings. Okay? Capital K, king of kings. And capital L, lord of lords. Okay? It's been put off. And he's saying... You won't know the time. We don't know the time. Verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is upon you. That's a key word. Because we're going to get to one of the reasons why he was received up the glory is so that the Holy Spirit could come down and, be, and come out to the world. Now someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Old Testament, I'm going through some of the Old Testament right now, the Holy Spirit... It seemed like God would give the Holy Spirit to one person at a time. Or there may have been a couple. God would speak to people. Back in the Old Testament, He'd actually speak to people. But when people actually received the Holy Ghost, like King David had, like um, Samuel, it wasn't a thing that was out into the world. The world could all have the Holy Ghost. The world could receive the Holy Ghost. That didn't happen until after Jesus was caught up in glory. Right. So that's one of the things we will talk about. One of the reasons why it's so important is Jesus being caught in the glory is so that the Holy Spirit can come down and we can start being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it says here also, after, And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. How can you be a witness for somebody if they're physically there? Okay. Now, I understand you can to a point, but I'm talking about for us to actually be ambassadors for Jesus Christ and witness for Jesus Christ, and it's supposed to be faith-based, Jesus had to go up. I understand Paul, uh, you had, uh, I think it was Barnabas, I might have the wrong name, but it had a brother in Christ that had to vouch for Paul. I'm a witness, and he witnesses to something that they weren't there and they didn't see. So if Jesus is presently there physically, what point, what's the point of me witness for him? He's there. He can speak for himself. Right. So I understand there's certain situations where witnessing can be done with the person there, but because Paul's standing there, and you, uh, like I said, once again, if I got the name wrong, please forgive me, but a brother in Christ, I think it's Barnabas, is vouching for uh, Paul. I hope I'm using the right word. I hope I didn't say Peter. I always keep mentioning the two of Peter and Paul. Peter, because they start with a P. Paul, first was Saul, became Paul. He's wreaking havoc of the church. So he's vouching for Paul. And, um, you know, he's being a witness to something that they didn't see. I saw Paul out there. He's preaching the gospel. He's doing this. He's doing that. But you weren't there to see it. Okay? Jesus goes up. They're going to be a witness. They shall be. 
future tense. They're not a witness for him present tense because Jesus is physically there. He gets, he gets caught up, um, received up into glory. Now they can be a witness for Jesus Christ. You can be an ambassador. For, we're, we're to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We have the ministry of reconciliation. Right? That's one of the big things of why he was received up into glory. So we can start testifying of him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you testify to people, to brethren, to the lost world, all the things that Jesus has done for you? Who Jesus is? Does your life reflect? Is your life a testimony of who Jesus is to you? Or are you just going along with the world? The ways of the world, looking like the world, doing um, traditions of men, letting sin run you, letting your flesh be in control and just look like the world and act like the world and laugh at the world's jokes? Or are you set apart and you're a witness the Bible talks about being a light, that Jesus is supposed to shine through you. Jesus is supposed to be in you, which is the Holy Ghost, and he shines through you. You're supposed to be a light into the world. This dark, dark place. You're not supposed to be turning that light off so you can go hang out with the world, lost world and do the things that the lost world does. You're supposed to be set apart. Something to think about. All right. Both... Uh, you shall be witnesses unto me both at Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they believed, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Notice how everybody has white apparel. And the reason I do that is because it's like someone, I might do a teaching someday. Because the big push is God's colors is red and green. God's colors is red and green. Uh, God's colors are more than just red and green. You can grab all through the Bible and grab things and show that this is God's color. This is God. One of God's colors is white. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. One of God's colors is red. But we're all wearing white. Jesus comes back wearing white. And he has a vesture that is dipped in blood. So he's, I think he's got a red vest on, but he's got a white robe. You know? If I'm wrong, correct me. But God has multiple colors. Don't be deceived into thinking that the only colors that are God's colors is red and green. Just because his throne is red and green, let's ignore the bow that goes over the top. Um, but just because his throne is red and green doesn't mean that's God's only colors. Okay? God created everything. God created everything. God has more than just two colors. But here we see white. We're always seeing white, white. Uh, why, uh, in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's people that have to wash their own robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay? Today, I'm washed and my robes are white. But Jesus is the one that does the washing. Right now, this body isn't washed. <laughs> Remember, we're two-thirds redeemed. This body is wicked, sinful, but there's going to come a day where God, and we're going to talk about it in here, one of the reasons he's caught up is an example of how we're going to be caught up. When he's received up in the glory, it's how we're going to be received up in his glory. Okay? And we're going to be given new bodies, incorruptible bodies. White robes are going to be given to us. Okay? Just be careful, brothers and sisters. When someone says something, you make sure you're comparing Scripture with Scripture and you're doing a Bible study for yourself. Don't just take my word for anything. White's the color of the Lord. Don't take my word for it. Do a study. Does white tend to appear a lot in certain situations? Uh, red and green appear in certain situations. Okay. Be careful. But they stood in white apparel. Two men stood in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now something i got to explain real quick when it comes to heaven. There's three heavens. When you do a Bible study, a full-on Bible study, there's three heavens. You have from the earth to the sky where we see the clouds. That's the first heaven. Okay, from that point to where you see the stars, that's the second heaven. And then past the stars, the third heaven, which is 
where, G, where God's throne is, it's where heaven is, where it talks about, where we're gonna get, I'm getting ahead of myself, where Jesus is preparing a place for us, there's the third heaven. So you can understand there's three heavens. When you do the Bible study, you understand the three heavens, and it starts talking about heavens, you'll understand what he's talking about. They only got to see him, it's during the day, they only got to see him exceed to the second heaven, which he went all the way up to the third heaven. But they didn't see him go through the second heaven or the third heaven. They only saw him ascend up to the first, for the first heaven until he disappeared out of their sight. Okay. But we're going to read about him coming out of the, second, of the third heaven to the second heaven to call us home. And people say, well, see, he's touching down. He's touching down because he's coming out of heaven. He must be touching down. There's three heavens. It's very important. So this received up in glory, we just read the instance of the received up in glory. This is the actual, what happened to Jesus Christ. Now I want to talk to you about why I think it was so important. They're being received up into glory. Well, one of the things is to prepare a place for us. Why did Jesus go up into glory? Where's Jesus right now? Why isn't Jesus here? Well, one of the things we already talked about, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ got put off. And what we're going to talk about is the time of the Gentiles. But we're going to go over these things step by step. So the first thing I want to talk about is he went to prepare a place for us. Where is Jesus at right now? Why was he received up into glory? To go prepare a place for you and me, brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to John 14, 1. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me, because Jesus is God. In my Father's house are many mansions. Let's stop right there. In my Father's house. What do I believe that's talking about? The third heaven. You can't really see, but <laughs> the third heaven. Then you've got the second heaven, and then you've got the heaven that we see every day. And when we see the stars, that's the second heaven. At night, you can see the second heaven. And then there's the third heaven. In, that, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. Talk about that heaven. And who's the door to that house? Jesus Christ. He says, I am the door. Um, brother in Christ, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, I disagree with him some of his recent studies, but one good study that he did way back when, when he was still focused on the Word of God as far as laboring in the Word, he did an amazing study on Jesus being the door. I suggest you go watch it. Jesus is the door, and the house that's being talked about here is heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I believe it's talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. Where I am, there ye may be also. It's talking about when people die. Today, in the Old Testament, when you died, your sins were covered, but they weren't paid for. So where did you go in the Old Testament when you died? You went to Abraham's bosom. Where did Jesus go for the three days that he was dead and buried? He went down to Abraham's bosom. Where's Abraham's bosom? It's in hell. And you please be careful. you got people that are so satanic and so wicked and teaching that Jesus burned in hell. No, he didn't. He went down to Abraham's bosom. He led captive, captivity captive and freedom and brought them to heaven. They can go to heaven now because who is the door? Jesus Christ. Okay. But when we die today, where do we go? If you're saved and born again, Bible believing, you're going through the door. Jesus has the keys of David, and it's in Revelation. You're going through the door. When you die, where do you go? You go to heaven. Jesus has a place prepared for you there. That's why you need to be careful in the sense of not being scared of what this world's going to do to you. And be not too fearful. I stand for the Word of God. If that gets me in prisons, so what? If that means I have to live poor to stand for the Word of God, because in order to have money and be rich, because you see what's going on out there, then I'd rather be poor and stay with the Word of God and stay true to the Lord. And if it gets to the point where I have to die for Jesus Christ and His perfect written Word, not compromise, and start doing things of the world to compromise. Oh, it's not a big deal. It's not. No, you're compromising. Are you going to stand for Jesus Christ to the point of willing to die for Him and His Word? If that happens, where do we go? We go to heaven. 
Why? Because he's gone to prepare a place for us. When he's received up into glory, which we read there, he's going to prepare a place for us. It's an amazing thing, brother and sister Christ. I can't fathom it. We're going to read the story a little bit down the road about Paul's vision of heaven. I believe it was Paul, but he doesn't want people to know it was him, so he just says he knew a man. But we can't fathom it. I look at all the beauty that we see around us right now, brothers and sisters in Christ. I look at the ocean. I tell, I tell people, brothers and sisters in Christ, I tell my family members, the lost world, God blesses me. I give God the glory. Remember, we're to give God glory in all things. And if you're doing something you can't give God glory in, you shouldn't be doing it. We give God glory in all things. And I tell people that God gives me silver and gold almost every day. Not every day, but most of the time he gives me silver and gold. I say, what are you talking about? There's a certain time of the day that I get to sit out on the deck and eat lunch. And if I miss it, I miss it. Because sometimes I get busy with work. But if I get to take 30 minutes to sit out on the deck and eat lunch, I can look down at the water and I've got my glasses that are my prescription sunglasses. Now, I agree with Brother Brian about the sunglasses. If you're out there working, I took the sunglasses off. I stopped wearing the sunglasses when I'm out there working. And I wasn't getting that much of a sunburn anymore. When you wear sunglasses and you're out in the sun for a long time, it can deceive your body into thinking it's not that bright and it won't put stuff in the skin that's supposed to protect it from getting sunburned. Uh, it won't, the body won't release things, in other words, into the skin to say, hey, the sun's out, it's hard. I understand that. But by wearing those glasses, they get rid of the glare. And I can sit there and I can look down at my little plot of the ocean and the way the sunbeam reflects off of it, it's like silver. I can see all the different lines and, and the, the design of the water and everything. And I'm like, I tell people, that's my silver that the Lord blesses me with. It's so beautiful. I, I can't fathom what heaven's going to be like. We see such beauty down here from God's creation. The gold I was talking about. The gold is, so you know, sometimes if you're up first thing in the morning, you can see the gold first thing in the morning. But for the most part, I see the gold in the evenings. And what I call a go is the sun goes down, and when the sun gets over the horizon to a certain point, everything starts to get that, gl that gold glow, the light that's on things. And the sun itself going down, if you can get the clouds just right, you can get the gold in the clouds. Sometimes you can get the amber, you know, the red. But God blesses me with silver and gold every day. And people are thinking, what, you're finding actual silver and gold? I said, no, this. But I'm looking at this... And it could be mountains. I love the mountains. I sit there and I look at the mountains. I have places where I can go and sit and pop up a chair and listen to the Bible being read and look at the mountains and everything and by the ocean and everything. And if I get tempted or I feel like the life is just getting too hard, I take I stop everything and take some time to spend with the Lord. And I suggest that for you too, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you think life is getting hard, you need to take some time to be with the Lord and talk with the Lord and read through His Word. But the beauty that we see out here, brothers and sisters Christ, you can't even fathom what heaven's going to be like. I'm like, Lord, I can't fathom this right here. I'm already in awe. I'm, point, I'm always pointing because right here, <laughs> out that window that's right there, down the hillside, there's a little section where I can see the ocean. Not a big one, but a small one. And it's a blessing. Okay? Um, I cut one tree down on my property and didn't realize it was, like, it was a huge bushy tree. And once we cut it down, it opened up that view. And I was like, Lord, that is amazing. It's such a blessing. And it is. So I'm pointing over there. That's why I'm pointing over there. I'm already in awe of the beauty that God has created here. I can't even fathom what he's preparing for us. So one of the reasons why he was received up into glory, brothers and sisters of Christ, is because he's going to prepare a place for you and me. Another reason he was received up to, into glory is so that the Comforter could come. You read all about the Holy Spirit and John 16, 1 through 6. But if you want to turn to John 16, 7, that's the important part for this study. Why did Jesus have to get received, get received up into glory? The, thousand, the, Jewish people, um, the Jewish people, as a nation, rejected Jesus Christ. You go through the book of Acts, they're still trying to push that kingdom of heaven. You know, it can also be referred to the kingdom of God. They're trying to push on the Jewish people. Come on, we need to get the Jews as a nation to accept Jesus so we can get Jesus back. I'm going to go off on a little side note. I was talking to the Lord about that. I was like, if I was Peter or John or any of the apostles that saw Jesus and was walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus and Jesus, I have to go away. 
I'd be desperate too to want him to come back. I want Jesus back. I miss walking with Jesus. I miss talking with him. I miss listening to him teach me about the, this life and how to live this life. You know, what's important, what's not important. I miss my, my, my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. But as a little side note, like I can see how they're desperate for it. But they're still trying to push that thousand year reign on the Jewish people of Jesus Christ, trying to get them as a nation to believe. And they reject him as a nation. So it goes on out into the world. But to receive the Comforter, Jesus can't be here. The body can't be here for us to receive the Comforter. Who said that? Jesus himself said it. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Just as I'm trying to. God's truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Holy Spirit coming down and going out into the world. People get saved and get baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's for today. In the Old Testament, it was a special thing that God would lend his spirit. Because he'd take it, you could lose it. You can get it and you can lose it in the Old Testament. Saul got it and he lost it. King David got it, made some mistakes. But his heart was right with the Lord. He loved the Lord, not his flesh. Even though his flesh got the better of him a few times. He still loved the Lord. Saul was all about the flesh. You could get the Holy Spirit and you could lose it. But today, in order to receive the Holy Spirit, in order for salvation to go out unto the world, which brings us to the next one, is he had to be received up into glory. And the next one I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit had to go out into the world, so then comes the time of the Gentiles. So the next part is, is so the time of the Gentiles can begin. Salvation going out to the world. We've read this before, but we'll read it again. Brother says Christ turned to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. We read, these, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. I'm sorry, I have said this before in other studies, and I say it again. I'm starting to think that the Samaritans, what they are, when you read the Old Testament, the word cut off, cut off doesn't always mean death, as far as physical death. It can mean death, but when I tried, I started doing a word study on cut off, and there's so many situations. And anytime it was talking about death, it would actually go a step further besides just saying cut off. Uh, one time it said in the Old Testament, cut off by the waters of the flood, and they were cut off from the earth. Talking about death, physical death. It would define itself a little bit more. But there's a lot of times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when cut off, it meant separated. There's a lot of punishments for breaking the holy days, the Sabbath days, the Levitical laws, that the consequences is that you were cut off from the Jewish people. You were not considered a Jew anymore. You're not a Gentile, but you're not considered a Jew anymore. So what's that? A Samaritan. Okay? So that's why they, they lost their inheritance. When Jesus was physically on the earth, his ministry was repent and believe that he was their king. It was repent, be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The thousand year reign, which is meant for Jews that still had that inheritance. But the Jews that were cut off, that's where I believe we get the Samaritans. There will be a whole other study someday. But that's where you get the Samaritans. But they weren't supposed to go to the Gentiles, they weren't supposed to go to the Samaritans. Why did Jesus have to get received up into glory? So the time of the Gentiles could begin. Why? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Peter, this is how difficult it was for them to get that grasp of it's the salvation. Remember that I, Jesus told them before his death and resurrection that he'd be preached unto the world. And they still had this hard thing about, well, it's just for the Jews. It's just for the Jews. We're only going to preach repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're just going to preach it to the Jews. God had to give Peter a vision. Peter falls into a trance and sees a vision in Acts 10, and he re-describes it in Acts 11. And we read in Acts 10, 11, if you want to turn it to Acts 10, 11, let's go ahead and read it real quick. He had to see a sign. Remember, Jews required a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. Peter would not have just preached to the Gentiles just to preach to the Gentiles. They were still so focused on the Jews. It's just for the Jews. It's just for the Jews. 
God had to give him a sign to say, hey, no, salvation has gone out into the world. You need to be preaching to everybody. You need to be preaching to the Gentiles. Acts 10, 11, And I saw heaven open and certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at all at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherewith were all manners of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And the Lord... And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. And you keep reading the story, and the whole point was is God... Through an angel told, I think it was an angel, but told some Gentiles, hey, there's a message that you need to get, that you need to receive, and you need to hear. You need to send someone and get Peter. There's going to be a man, Simon, surnamed Peter. You need to go send your servants over there and get him. And as the servants were going over, that's when he had this vision. Why? Because I believe if he didn't have this vision, he would have told them, sorry, I'm only here to preach to the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not go in the way of the Samaritans. God had to show them that, hey, salvation has come to the Jews. And you keep reading, and when he's talking about it in verse uh, chapter 11, because we've already talked about this in other studies, you have the Jews that then has God granted repentance to salvation to the Gentiles. It's like they didn't believe it until they saw that they received the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because they weren't going to preach to the Gentiles. What was so important about Jesus being received up into glory is so the time of the Gentiles can come in. And the time of the Gentiles is till the catching away of the body of Christ. That's when the time of the Gentiles will end. Okay. Turn to Paul as far as salvation. And then you go into the time of Jacob's trouble where God turns his eyes back to, to Jacob. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. What about Paul? Okay, Paul was wreaking havoc on the church. He was killing Christians. But you read in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, if you want to turn there, Acts 9, 15. We read, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, to all the earth. Okay? But predominantly, he had to make a point of to the Gentiles. And this is speaking to Ananias. Paul's on the way to Damascus. He sees Jesus Christ. Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Because it was Saul and then later became Paul. Why persecutest thou me? He's blinded. What do you want me to do, Lord? He humbles himself. Repentance. What do you want me to do, Lord? He said, go to this place, wait there, and I'll send somebody to you. And he sends Ananias. All right. Uh, Acts 13, 46. I want to read these three times where they keep, Paul still keeps trying to go to the Jewish people. He's predominantly the, the gent, uh, he's predominantly the apostle to the Gentiles. But he still has such a love for his brethren that he keeps going to them. So I want to read these three verses again. You don't have to turn there, but, because we've talked about them before. But Acts 13, 46, it reads, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Talking about the Jews. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. In Acts 18.6, another set of Jews, God's, uh, uh, Paul's heart yearns upon his brethren, blood brethren, not spiritual brethren, but by blood, and says his people, Acts 18.6, and when they opposed themselves, how many times have you got them across to people that oppose themselves? What's going on right now this month? There's a lot of people opposing themselves and blaspheming. But this is not talking about sin. This is talking about salvation. Okay? And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own head. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. That needs to be our attitude, brothers and sisters Christ. When you're preaching salvation, when you're preaching absolute truth to anybody, saved or lost, when you're preaching absolute truth to somebody, if they don't want it, brush the dust off your feet and move on. Move on to somebody who does want it. Right. 
Don't get stuck fighting and trying to force feed truth to somebody that doesn't want it. Mainly the lost world. You know, I'm not a salesman. I always said that. I'm not a salesman. I'll link the gods. People try to get in fights with me since I was newly saved to today. Seven years, people have always been trying to get in a fight with me online about salvation. And I don't fight with them. I link God's message, the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You confess both in prayer, because with the mouth, confession is, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto what? Salvation. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ask God to save you. That's always been the true biblical plan of salvation. You preach against sin. Sin is wrong. You're a sinful, wicked man. You need Jesus Christ. That's always how it's been preached in the past by true Bible-believing Christians. And today, that gospel has been perverted. But I don't sit there and force-feed it to them. They try to get into a debate with me. I show them a few scriptures. They ignore those few scriptures. They don't want truth. I just present the gospel to them. And I'm done. And that's what I do with truth when it comes to brethren. If it gets heated where I'm trying to quote truth to you about any subject, video games are wrong. Hollywood movies are wrong. Okay? Um, drinking and getting drunk is wrong. Fornicating. Okay? Holidays. Okay? If you look behind holidays, like I said, we'll get into it eventually again, but I've already got some videos on it. But holidays, they're all about elevating the flesh. They're not about... Uh, they're not unto the Lord in uh, Romans 14, 6. They're not unto the Lord. They're unto the flesh. It's all about elevating the flesh. So when people don't want to hear it, you got Paul had the best example. Dust, brush the dust off your feet and move on. Move on to someone who does want to hear it. Sorry for going off on that a little bit, but that Paul has the best example. You can save yourself a lot of stress and a lot of drama because that's what the lost world loves. They love, the lost world loves drama. They thrive on drama. They thrive on stress. They thrive on debating. They thrive on bitterness and hate and anger. You don't want that in your life. Just move on. Just move on. Okay? And the last time, it was Acts 28, 28. He's trying to preach to the Jews, and they reject the third group of Jews that haven't heard about Jesus Christ. They reject, so the nation as a whole still reject Jesus Christ throughout Acts as a whole. There were Jews that got saved, but they rejected him as a whole. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And they did. There was a lot more Gentiles getting saved than Jews. Why? Because it's the time of the Gentiles. How do we know this? Turn to Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Luke 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, one can argue that this could still, the time of the Gentiles could be extended into the time of Jacob's trouble because there will be Gentiles that get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. But for the most part, at the catch away of the body of Christ, the body of Christ leaves and God is going back to dealing with the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. And when the thousand year reign starts at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of the Gentiles, is there's no argument there, it's definitely going to be an end. Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Okay. But remember what Matthew, I put Matthew 11, uh, Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 reads, And from the day of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and violent take it by force. Right now people are still fighting over Jerusalem. Jerusalem's having to defend itself hardcore. And down through the past, our, the history, all the way back to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they're fighting. Even during Jesus' time, they're fighting. The Romans, they're under Roman occupation, if you want to say, at that time. You go back to um, Nebuchadnezzar, okay? They were under occupation then. Because they had defied God and turned their back on Him. This nation, America, the reason it's fallen apart is because it's turned its back on God. I had a brother in Christ, just to say this real quick, I had a brother in Christ that said that 
There's no arguments worth getting into when it comes to America. Why? Because the number one thing that America needs to do as a whole is everybody needs to bow their knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. You think this nation is going to do that? No. This nation, America, predominantly hates Jesus Christ. They hate His Word. They're not going to bow a knee to Jesus Christ. And that's what it'll take to turn America around. I mean, we can talk about specific things, but all summed up, what it's going to do is they have to bow their knee before the Lord Jesus Christ and submit themselves to this Word. Are they going to do that? No. They're trying to do away with this. They're trying to have good morals outside the Bible. It's no longer God says it's wrong. It's, I feel it's wrong. And if I feel it's wrong, what does that lead to? Someone else saying, I don't feel it's that wrong. And that's how perversion comes in. It's not because I feel it's wrong, or it's just good morals or anything. It's because God says it's wrong. Mm -hmm. But you see there, until the Gentiles be fulfilled, he got caught up so salvation can go on to the world. The time of the Gentiles. And like I said, you can argue that I say it kind of ends at the catching away of the body of Christ, but thinking about it, you could easily persuade me to say, well, we can extend it to the seven-year period because there will be Gentiles that get saved, and they're still fighting over Jerusalem and the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? But one of the reasons why Jesus got caught up and received up into glory is so that the Holy Spirit could come down. So the time of the Gentiles could start. Salvation can go on to the world. It's no longer of the Jews. It's to the world now. Right. One of the reasons he was received up in the glory, I believe, is to show us what the catching away looks like. Now how we always had disagreements, there's people arguing, I think it's going to happen in the blink of an eye, and, and this and that, and you have these you know, left behind movies where in a flash of light, all of a sudden, all these clothes are left behind, and these people are just gone and everything. It's like, but what does the Bible say? How did Jesus ascend up? He was already in his incorruptible body. Right? So how did he ascend up? But let's read the Bible about us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. The catching away of the body of Christ. Falsely called the rapture. Falsely called the, uh, the great tribulation. Uh, the... Um, the rapture before the great tribulation. Both of those are false titles. Okay, It's the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. You could also say Daniel's 70th week, but I prefer the time of Jacob's trouble because there's no argument. The time of Jacob's trouble. God turns back to Jacob. The Bible says uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel. In part, God's not done with them. Okay? But what's going to happen to us, catching away the body of Christ, before the time of Jacob's trouble? 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We have hope, brothers, says Christ. We have hope. They don't. That's what's supposed to separate us from the lost world big time. We have hope. No matter what this world throws at us, or how hard this world gets, or what happens to us, we have hope. What's that hope? We're going to be in heaven. God's, Jesus is preparing a place for us. We're going to be in heaven with our Lord and Savior. King of kings, Lord of lords, our Savior, our friend, Jesus Christ, who is God fully and completely. We have hope. They don't. If you're those false converts, the reason they stress out so much and the lost world is they have no hope. 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We talked about this, people dying before the time of Jacob's trouble. Their soul goes up to heaven. they got a place prepared for them. They're in heaven now with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They haven't been resurrected. The body hasn't been resurrected yet, but the soul is up there. You don't have to go to Abraham's bosom anymore. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Those who have died before the catching away of the body of Christ, they will be raised incorruptible just like we will. And they will be caught up just like we will, just like Jesus was. We're going to be received up into His glory. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now stop there. That's why I was talking about the heaven where it talks about that. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. See, he's descending, so he's coming down to the earth. Well, if you believe there's only one heaven, yeah, that, I can see you getting that. But if you actually do a Bible study on it, there's three heavens. He's descending from the heaven that we can't see, period. We can't see heaven. To the stars, and he's up in the clouds to call us home. He doesn't touch down. It's not his coming back like it is at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. He's actually going to touch down and make war. Open his mouth, and that two-edged sword comes out and wipes out the, I think it's like the 300 or 200 to 300 million man army. Just wipes them out. All right. But that's the heaven it's talking about. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's why it's the catching away of the body of Christ. We're going to be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. If you die, we have hope. If you die today, you're going to go be, and you're truly saved and born again, you're going to go be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's got a place prepared for you. If you're blessed to live and be alive at the end, to see the catching away of the body of Christ, it's a blessed thing. It's a, it's, we have hope. We're going to get our, not only are we going to go be with the Lord and we have a place prepared for us, we're going to get our incorruptible bodies. The people that die before the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to have to wait to get that incorruptible body at the catching away of the body of Christ. But regardless, we have hope because we're going to be with our Lord and Savior. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Where does it say in a moment in a twinkling of an eye? Now, people say, well, didn't you just add that we're going to be made incorruptible and everything? Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. That gives a little bit more detail. But you notice in there, there is no blink, moment, twinkling of an eye. Why? Because this is just talking about the dead and Christ are going to be raised. And we're all going to be, we're all going to be caught up. And I've always taught this, brothers and sisters of Christ. Imagine there's a hole right here. And I'm walking, and something, there's a big event... But for this analogy, there's a log there that I don't see, and I trip. And I see that hole, and I'm going to fall right into that hole. Someone catches me and pulls me up and prevents me from falling into that hole. Now, that hole is the time of Jacob's trouble. That log that I tripped on is there's an event that happens that triggers the time of Jacob's trouble. And God's going to catch us and pull us up and say, no, you're not going into that time of Jacob's trouble. You're not falling into that hole. That's why the word catching up is biblical and it's what God's talking about. When you try to change God's word into a lie, be careful about that. I've seen brethren do that. They'll say the word of God and then they'll change it to some other word because it makes their teaching sound right. They change the word of God to get their teaching to work. Be very careful about that. It's not rapture. Okay, it's caught up or catching away for future tense, the, ca the catching away. But nowhere in there is a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's, I believe it's going to be a big event. Jesus saw, everybody saw him, cloud form under his feet. He starts going up to be in the clouds and it's like, it's something they're sitting there. And they're still sitting there watching a while later. It's not something that happened in a moment of eye. They're sitting there looking and they have the two guys in white robes tell them, why are you looking up in heaven? It's not so, why would, if it happened in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, how would they know Jesus went to heaven? They wouldn't. He'd just be, boom, he's gone. They'd be looking left and right. Where'd he go? They wouldn't be looking up. Why are they looking up? Because Jesus, it took time for him to go up. It was an event that everybody got to see. I believe the catching away of the body of Christ is going to be an event that the whole world sees. Now, what's the moment in the twinkle and I talking about? 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now it explains how they're raised. Before, it was just talking about when we read in the first day, they're just raised. And we which remain are going to be caught up into heaven. It's an event that's going to take time, and the world's going to see it. I believe it. But when you talk about our incorruptible, how do we get our incorruptible bodies? We go from corruptible to incorruptible. 
That part is, happens in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. One minute, there's nobody beside me. Next minute, a dead in Christ person is beside me in his incorruptible body. Just like that. Boom. There he is. Now look at me, and boom. In an instant, in the moment, I have an incorruptible body. That's why it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. Our corruptible bodies can't be in heaven. This corruption must put on incorruption. That's why the people, the dead in Christ, their soul gets to go to heaven because their soul, remember that spiritual circumcision made without hands. Their soul is connected to Jesus Christ. Jesus is their body. Jesus is my body. That's why we're called the body of Christ. This filthy, wicked body is still not allowed in heaven. My soul is, but the body isn't. We have to be incorruptible. We have to have incorruptible bodies. That's why it says must. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on, have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's talking about the law of sin and death. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law, the law of sin and death. We say, like right now, I have been liberated. That's why we have liberties. One of the liberties the Bible talks about is being liberated from the law of sin and death. But it will be proven at the catching away of the body of Christ. That's when that proven that we prove to, to the world that we are freed from the law of sin and death. Okay, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it talks about liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, I can get into liberty all over again, but I've got studies on them. Go watch it. But this is a good example. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Steadfast, unmovable. Are you steadfast, brothers and sisters of Christ? Are you unmovable? Not just in your belief in the catching away of the body of Christ, but the life that you're living for Jesus Christ, present tense. Are you immovable? Are you steadfast? If you truly believe that Jesus can come back any day now, not a year from now, not 10 years from now, not 100 years from now, not five generations from now. If you truly believe that Jesus can come back any day now, your life is going to reflect it. Are you steadfast? Are you unmovable? Are you always abounding in the work of the Lord? For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Are you working hardcore on sanctification? Lord, I want to earn rewards in heaven. The judgment seat of Christ, I need to get busy doing work for you. I need to make sure I'm reading my Bible every day. Start your day with the Bible, end your day with the Bible. Prayer, I need to be praying all the time, Lord. Help me to pray more. Just talk with the Lord all the time. Talk to Him about the Word. Talk to Him about what's going on in the world. Talk to Him about your fears, your worries. Okay. Talk to Him about the brethren. Pray about the brethren. Big time pray about the brethren. Okay. But are you living... Steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. See, these false converts in these Babel buildings in the lost world, they're abounding in the work of the flesh. They're just going crazy with the world. The ways of the world, how the world does things, and some of that creeps in and starts getting some of us. You know what I'm talking about and who I'm talking to. Okay? We're supposed to be separate from the world. And we need to remain separate from the world. But we're not supposed to be abounding in the flesh. We're supposed to be abounding in the work of the Lord. Okay. But that's the moment in the twinkling of an eye. The flesh changes. Okay. Jesus showed us the example. When he is caught up, I believe that's how we're going to be caught up. We're going to hear our name called. And we're going to look up and hear Philip Newton. And then boom, I'm going to hear something. Maybe. And I'm going to look to my left. There's a dead in Christ next to me. Oh, there's a dead in Christ over there. Oh, there's a dead in Christ over there. There's just all these people. Brothers and sisters in Christ, going all the way back to Paul, going back to Peter, going back to John. And then we're going to hear, come up hither, and we're all going to start going up. 
and the whole world's going to see it. Why was it so important that Jesus was received up in the glory? I think one of the reasons was is he gave us an example of how we're going to be received up in his glory. Oh yeah. And last, and also I put on here 2 Corinthians 12. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. Peter, not Peter, I'm sorry, Paul. P-E-P, -P, I gotta keep, Paul. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. It's talking about the soul. That's why I couldn't tell whether he's in the, heaven, in the body or out of the body. The body's, you have the body and the soul. I can't quite explain how everything works, but I believe he's in the soul and he's up to heaven. He got stoned to death. His soul goes up to heaven and gets a glimpse of what heaven looks like. And God's like, uh, I'm not done with you yet. And sends the soul back down and says, Peter, get, or Paul, get back up and get back to work. And Paul gets up and gets back to work. But whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Shut the one caught up to the third heaven. Third heaven. So this is the Bible saying this. There's three heavens. Okay, the third heaven is where God's see, uh, the, the um, throne is. That's where his mansion is. That's where Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Okay, I was caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for us to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Someone makes it to heaven and actually finally gets there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, catching away happens. Praise the Lord. We're there. We're finally dead. Death, where's thy victory? You know, sin, where's thy victory? Right. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Right. Victory. We have victory. That's the one I will glory in. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Sometimes God allows bad things to happen to us to remind us of this very important thing. And you ready for that? You want to know what that one important thing is? The reason He allows us to go through infirmities and go through bad times is to remind us one very important thing. This is in our home. I always say this is our home away from home. This is not our home. This house here, God lets me dwell here. But it's not my home. It's the best place I've lived my entire life. I tell the Lord this. This place, I thank the Lord so much for this place. It's the number one place that I've had my whole life where it's abstained from all appearance of evil. That it's a godly home. I praise the Lord and thank Him for this home. But God will do things sometimes to remind us that this isn't my home. Oh, you're right, Lord. This isn't my home. I just dwell here. You're allowing me to live here. Where's our home? It's up there. Jesus is preparing our home. He's preparing a place for us. And we need to remember that. You start falling into the trap of, I've got to have so many rewards down here, and I've got to have so much stuff down here. That's because you're forgetting this isn't your home. Our home's up there, not here. Be careful. Okay. And last but not least, <laughs> as they say, one of the reasons that he's caught up in the glory is to show how he's going to come back. Remember the two men sitting there in the right robes? Mm -hmm. Saying this same Jesus has gone up, he'll return the same way. Only he's going to be on a horse. And he won't be alone. Turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I threw that in there real quick because today, more than anything in the world with these professing Christians out there, they tend to worship men. I'm of uh, Robert Breaker. I'm of Edward P.F. I'm of, and some people, I'm of Brother Philip, or I'm of Brother Brian, or I'm of Brother Brad. And they can become a respecter of persons. It's not about this being the standard. This being the standard of absolute truth. It's, uh, so-and-so said this, so it's got to be okay. They said what I want, so I can shop around. Okay, uh, um, this brother in Christ is okay with Christmas, so I'm going to follow him. 
Um, this brother, I don't want Christmas, so I'm not going to follow him. But this brother in Christ over here, he's okay with video games, so I'm going to follow him. Oh, this brother in Christ over here, he's okay, and he tries to pervert scripture to justify satanic style music, and so on and so forth. Remember, God is. This is our final authority. We're supposed to be worshiping God, not men. We're not supposed to be a respecter of persons. That's so important. If I'm wrong, correct me through the scriptures. By all means, do it with love. Do it with charity. Be humble about it. Don't get prideful. But, brothers and sisters of Christ, I don't want you worshiping me. If I'm wrong somewhere, and I'm so stubborn that I won't give it up, don't follow me. Follow this right here, the Word of God. This is what matters. Worship God, not me. And I see that a lot happening. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. We're not supposed to be like that, brothers and sisters of Christ. Was you, were you baptized in, Philip, in the name of Philip? Were you baptized in the name of Brian? Were you baptized in the name of uh, Robert Breaker? Were you baptized in the name of Edward P.F.? I can keep going. Any of these pastors in these Babel buildings? No. You are baptized, if you're truly saved and born again, spiritual baptism. You are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Please, brothers and Christ, we, I can push this until I'm... I'm going to keep pushing this to my dying days. If I die before the catching away of the body of Christ, I pray my last breath is, stick to the book, or somewhere along the lines, chapter and verse. This is your foundation. Worship God, not men. Okay, I'm always going to be pushing this until the day I die. This is our foundation on matters of faith and practice. And practice. No, just faith. Just faith. I'll practice however I want to practice. It's just for faith. No, faith and practice. Okay. Let's keep reading here. Verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness... He doth judge and make war. It's, it's, it's not funny. It's not a coincidence that he says, worship God. Worship God. And then next thing you know, what does John see? He sees God. In the flesh, Jesus Christ. The body of God. The body of God, the Godhead. The person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were of a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was cozed with, with a vesture, vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the, called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That's those who suffer for him. Yeah, in these last days, sorry, I stopped there. In these last days, brothers and sisters of Christ, loneliness is a big thing. I had a brother in Christ remind me that in these last days, Paul in his last days was alone, and it gets lonely as a Christian. We're so spread out, and one of the ways we suffer for Jesus Christ is if you continue to stand for this book, you're going to be set apart from this world. You're not going to have much in common with this world. The festivals, the holidays of this world the wickedness and sin, anything that's fleshly of this world, the things of this world is always going to be contrary. They're trying to pull you away from Scripture. To be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, man or woman today, means being isolated from this world. Seriously. And we're so spread out, we're almost not isolated. Like we're not purposely isolating ourselves from each other, but we're so spread out. We're so spread thin. The brethren that are actually still standing and haven't fallen... And all these false converts, it's just a mess out there. You're going to have to go through a lot of suffering for Jesus Christ. And it might mean losing your job. It might mean losing your, your life. Go as far as losing your life. Okay? Those are the people that are coming back with him. And, a, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. We always joke around about the sword, but the sword coming out of his mouth. But what is that sword? It's the Word of God. 
that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Time of the Gentiles will come to an end, guaranteed by then. Before that happens, the time of the Gentiles will come to an end. The time, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, more than anything, is it's for the Jewish people. Okay. God's turning back to the Jewish There might be some Gentiles getting saved, but God's primary focus is on the Jewish people. But him being received up into glory, brothers and sisters in Christ, is another way of showing how he's going to come back down. We're going to come back down with him. It shows how we're going to go up, and it shows how we're also going to come down. Okay. Brothers and sisters in Christ, received up into glory, make sure that this is your main foundation in all matters of faith and practice. And that you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. That was one of the biggest things. I was like, you got to keep, that's what it means, that crown of life. It's not that I believe in the catching away of the body of Christ with my words. Does your life reflect it? Okay? Are you set apart from this world? Are you living for Jesus Christ every day? Because he could come back. You're looking at Jesus Christ. That's my job now that God's, I believe God's called me into ministry. That's my job to help you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Not me. Not the world. Sometimes you can get stuck, get caught up in what's going on in the world and get distracted by what's going on in the world. But our job, men that are in ministry, we're to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. We're to help you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. This is not our home. We need to get busy working for abounding in the work of the Lord, as we read. We need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what it means to truly believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. You find yourself just sitting there and not doing much for the Lord, then you're not looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you were looking for the Lord, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd get busy living for the Lord. And I'm not saying you have to be in ministry, full-time ministry. We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. Get out there and witness for Jesus Christ. God opens a door. He'll give you the courage to do it, to witness for Him. Leave gospel tracts places. But it's something as simple as, are you reading your Bible every day? I'm pointing over towards my nightstand. My bed's right here. I'm pointing over towards my nightstand. Do you read your Bible every morning and every night before you go to bed? Do you pray every day? Are you giving God thanks all the time for everything that you have? Are you giving God glory for all things? And I've always preached this. If you can't give God thanks for it, you shouldn't be doing it. If you can't give God glory for it, you shouldn't be doing it. But are you doing those things? And if you want to donate to ministries and get some rewards, yeah, but I think the people that are really pushing this donation, you get tons and tons of rewards if you donate, man. And I'm like, no, I think the rewards, the, the crown rewards, you look into them, yeah, donating is a good thing. But you need to be doing work yourself. You need to be living your life for Christ yourself. You don't expect somebody, right here, you don't expect somebody behind the camera to do it for you. You got to do it for yourself. Okay? I always told people, I can pray for you, but I can't pray for you. And people don't seem to get it. Some do. Some of the brethren got it. Praise the Lord. But the point is, is I can pray that God watches over you and that you don't stray. And if you're going through any hard times, I just asked for prayer requests recently about Victoria. She's sitting on the bed right now, so she doesn't make noise on the floor. Um, that I gotta take her in, she's gotta get some teeth removed, and it's gonna cost me, and um, I've gotta weigh it, you know. I, I'd rather, I, I don't wanna lose her because she's been a great dog, a great pet, a great blessing from the Lord. Um, and I've asked for prayer. So you can, I can pray for you, but honestly, I always told people, I took that to the Lord first. Before I asked you guys for prayer for Victoria, I took it to the Lord first and asked for prayer. When I asked you guys to pray for my, for my daughter and my relationship with my daughter and that the God will open up doors and everything, I prayed to God first. I can pray for you, but I can't pray for you. You've got to live for Jesus Christ yourself. Stop relying on other people to do it for you. you need to, in these last days, you definitely need to get up 
and start doing work doing work for the Lord. Okay. And like I said, I do a lot of work around here. I've got a garden out there. I've got chickens out here. I go fishing. I'm trying to learn how to hunt. Um, butcher a bear. I got to butcher a bear. Finally, I was like, I have a lot more respect for people who butcher animals for meat to eat. Not killing just to kill, but for meat to eat, to survive, to live. It's hard work. Okay? But you can do those things unto the Lord. And give God thanks for him. The garden. Why? Because this body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. And is to be without blemish. And I'm trying to grow food because the food I grow here is a lot healthier than the junk you get at the grocery stores these days. Praise the Lord, I've got a farmer's market. But I'm also trying to save money. Okay, I'm trying to help the brethren out. Anything extra that I get, I try to share with the brethren. And I've been doing things to save money. But it's also healthy. The fishing, the hunting, it saves money and it's healthier. Um, the chickens, I get all the eggs I want and every year I butcher so many chickens and I hatch so many chickens to replace the ones I butchered. So I'm trying to eat healthy because his body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Brother, sister Christ, there's things that you can do to live and eat healthy. Okay, go for walks, talking with the Lord and, and nature that God created and praise the Lord for it. All right. So please, please, this is the foundation. Jesus was received up into glory. Someday we will too. And someday we're all, hopefully, I pray for everybody that I know and love, brothers and sisters of Christ, and the brethren as a whole, that most of you get to come back, with, and I get to come back. You know, the Bible says, if we suffer for him. And you have brethren, I'm telling you right now, you have brethren out there that are not suffering for Jesus Christ. They're caving in and doing the things of the world. And they're starting to look like the world, act like the world. It's called the falling away. They're falling away. They're not standing. They're not steadfast. They're not unmovable. Okay. So, thank you for this study. Sorry for how long it was, but I hope you followed along with me. We finished it. I answered a brother's email. They, he wanted this, and I actually enjoyed it. Thank you for suggesting going through this verse and going through it step by step and figuring out, okay, what does the Bible say about this, and how can we relate it to that? How can we apply it to today and our lives today? Okay, so I just I thank that brother in Christ. Sorry it took so long, um, but we finally got through it. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, my love for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I want grace and peace for everybody. My love for you will always be in Jesus Christ. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you for watching.